I'm Hotep and welcome uh, Smog here for the Egyptian Magic Podcast. A uh, bit of a break uh, since I was last doing the, the podcast. I, I did do a whole lot of other recordings for the uh, Thelemic Symposium, some of which had a kind of Thelemic and Egyptian theme to it, as did the symposium. Quite a lot of stuff that came up in that. Perhaps we'll get a chance to talk about that at some future time. Um, yeah, it's been a quite a busy month or two with, uh, with the symposium and other kind of bits and pieces and organizing and writing and whatever. So I thought I'd get back to some sort of sequence. Actually, what I'm doing now is uh, picking up some talks that I did. I did a talk a couple of months back uh, at the, I don't know, Psychedelic uh, Forum, I think it was called, which was in actually in Oxford. Psychedelic Society had a kind of a, a whole day event, which was mostly kind of music uh, bands and uh Kind of disco type thing but also exhibitions and also uh which is a bit of a trend a, a kind of um a, a lecture room a, a room where people giving talks illustrated talks on various things you know not just to do with psychedelics but do with history and uh, just all sorts of things that people might be interested in so that was rather good and i was lucky enough to kind of be able to be there and to be uh invited to do a talk yeah invited to do a talk uh so the theme of the whole conference the whole day was uh with duality uh so i kind of uh, you know picked up that bit of duality in ancient egyptian religion and in thalema as well which i kind of wove into it as hinted at by uh, by the word, this is kind of more or less the sort of stuff that I talked about. As hinted by the word dual, within it, du duality uh, refers to having two parts, often with opposite meanings, like the duality of good and evil. Uh, if there are two sides to a coin, metaphorically speaking, there we, we tend to say there's a, some kind of duality at work. Peace and war, love and hate, up and down, black and white, these are all kind of dualities. So uh, quite, I could almost talk about anything. So a way of looking at the world that is not one-dimensional, let's say that, but makes it a little bit more complex. Uh, perhaps the idea that all things are a little bit relative. As I say, duality means that things are either, not that things are either black or white, but both things can be true at the same time. Uh, reality, in, in a way. There's a saying, in fact, going to another tradition, which also interested me, which is from the Yoga Sutras, a text which was written about 2,000 years ago. And rather interestingly, there's a kind of uh, a phrase there that uh, yoga which probably meant something slightly different to what we think of as yoga these days. But back then, yoga had a a kind of broader meaning to do with uh, philosophy and also magic sometimes. Anyway, in the Yoga Sutras, it says yoga is neither black nor white, but it's kind of in between. It's gray, some sort of synthesis between the two. So yoga, that's how they defined yoga. And some say that this is the ancient uh, pagan attitude too, hence there wouldn't be one god. There's always going to be a plurality or a duality of gods. In fact, in, in other theologies apart from the Western, the idea that the gods have to be plural seems to be more of a common sense view. The idea that one god can represent the whole of creation seems a little bit over uh, simplification from a kind of oriental point of view. The, the ancient pagan culture uh, has a, a most influence these days on us, I'd say, whether you acknowledge it or not, is, of course, as you would expect in, on the Egyptian Magic podcast, that of Egypt. It has this huge influence on us, often not 
completely recognize. So a key question when looking at Egyptian religion is why why bother? <laughs> why would you be interested in Egyptian re religion or its philosophy? Apart maybe from the kind of esotericism, the you know, exoticism of it, the beauty, the beauty of it, the beautiful images, uh, and and undoubtedly, if you uh, if you look at if I uh, show you a little kind of uh, slideshow, mini slideshow of images, they are very very beautiful and kind of fascinating in their own right. Whether that you subscribe to the ideas behind behind it historically we were warned off doing so i can in our own not our own but in one particular tradition the christian tradition uh or the biblical tradition maybe there's uh there's this idea that anything graven images images that are made or especially images of gods that's always a little bit problematic in fact one of the Ten Commandments, if that's influential, actually forbids it. And you can't help thinking that when they forbid uh, making of images of gods and graven images, they obviously had in Egypt in mind because that's the locus classicus, as they say, of the graven image. You can't think of a more visual culture than Egypt. Anyway, the Egyptians, they were very much into a more dualistic approach, dualities, if you like. Uh, and you can always break uh, Egyptian ideas down into these dualities and dualities within dualities. Here's a good one. It says that the whole of Egyptian religion could be expressed in two things, the worship of the sun god, most obvious thing, the worship of the sun. And secondly, the worship of the moon, I suppose, and especially uh, the god Osiris, who is also sometimes referred to as the sun at midnight, and the sun at midnight is just another way of referring also to the moon. Osiris, the lord of death and the underworld. So that whole complex of ideas, Osiris and the sun god, that's, those are two break into two categories there's a dualism for you and they kind of interact with each other and merge into each other and one becomes the other so within them we can say there are lots of sub dualities uh, sun has a day and a night uh, form uh, he moves through our world and he moves through another world there's another duality <laughs> Egypt, uh, I should point out, one of the interests for us for philosophically or as modern people is that in terms of its ideas and stuff, nobody really owns it now. It, it, there's no kind of um, continuation as such. So different cultures live there, have moved into the area, although obviously they're very interested in and they're custodians of that. But in a sense, this is why Egypt belongs to everybody, because it belongs to nobody. So it's it's part of our universal common culture. Another would be uh, we could look at is the interesting idea of a a social contract in in ancient Egypt. Uh, this is an old idea there, but it's also a very modern idea that a lot of people relate to. So, interestingly, they don't really have, as far as we know, as far as has been discovered, there's no sort of, there's no equivalent of the Ten Commandments. Interesting that kind of Israelites came out of Egypt and they have these set of commandments, but there's no equivalent of that within uh, Egypt itself, as far as people know, or it's debatable whether there was. Perhaps they felt, they needed that as another way of separating and defining themselves against this culture that they were part of, but also were leaving. People sometimes talk about ancient Babylon and uh, the laws of uh, Hammurabi. Been a lot of talk about that recently, I noticed in the internet and all the rest. But if you look at those laws, which have 
very old law code. Uh, some of them seem a little bit oppressive, really. <laughs> yeah. They're not really attractive as a, a law code. That's the thing about law codes. And after a while, they kind of get to be oppressive things. Which is another interesting, compare that then again with the duality of Egypt, where they, where they didn't have a formal law code as such, as I say, as far as we know. They had more of a kind of set of guide, guiding principles. Uh, so take it, they, they, I don't think anybody's ever found something like a marriage code or a formal marriage ceremony from Egypt. Again, that's another interesting duality or point of kind of uh, comparison between us and uh, and egypt they they just seem to get on with it they may have had kind of letters of understanding or a kind of contract or like a prenuptial arrangement or whatever it was to de decide you know who got what uh but that's not exactly what we mean by this kind of indissoluble marriage code that's was quite popular in the West until quite recently, and still it has a lot of popularity. So you could say the relationship between the sexes is also one of the great dualities of life. Uh, and in the most reasonable place in the ancient world, I would say, uh, Egypt in terms of that relationship is probably the, the, the most as ancient cultures go, the most liberated or least oppressed of the cultures, and it, and things seem to get better the further back you go as well. They go downhill <laughs> from ancient times. So there's a kind of idea that uh, the absence of a formal code and the reliance more on people's natural sense of uh, morality and, and what is right and fair and of what is justice seems to kind of generate a within limits again a kind of a, a more benign and livable society so there's a lesson there from the duality between law and not law as i say the further back you could go you could uh, even say that 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 happened in the in the, the level of government as well that um, we tend to think about or well, for a while that uh, government is you, the idea of you need one uh, a king you need a, or you need a strong ruler a prime minister or president some you know we we say we admire someone who kind of takes control but and the idea of a kind of cooperative thing of a dual leadership or a shared leadership uh I mean, I, I, now in the political sphere, the, there are kind of some parties that are experimenting with the kind of twin leadership, but they tend to get a lot of stick for for doing that. But perhaps the further back you go into Egypt, they had this idea of a, a dual leadership, certainly on a level of king and queen. The very earliest dynasties who achieved so much in Egypt and built the pyramids, there seemed to be this very equal basis or uh you know between the, the you certainly have the instance of female rulers even from the very very earliest of the uh, egyptian pharaohs or or kings there were uh queens or female rulers who took over and and ruled quite successfully uh sometimes it's true until a kind of male ruler grew up, but sometimes just because they were good at what they did. Uh, I say there's some very interesting examples of that. Or you could sometimes have co-regentship between two brothers or between a father and a son ruling together. Uh, so there's another duality that uh, existed and perhaps is a model for how because it was, it was quite a successful system. It had its ups and downs. But uh, So when we talk about the state of duality, we're really looking for some sort of balance uh, between two things. That's the idea that we really want. And they may not be even exact opposites, uh, but, the, but somehow we like the idea of two things. We understand the, uh, uh, 
when we can think about a relationship between two things that somehow is easier to grasp than a thing in itself. Uh, and, and that's a common enough pattern. So, you may, you know, people talk about pleasure and pain as a duality, but is pleasure really just the absence of pain or is it something else? Or is a woman really just the opposite of man or they're just two different things that we bring together? You see what I mean? Like, what, why, why man opposite woman? They're just together. Why is one opposite to the other? But people, sometimes the language leads you into these kind of um, these sort of these sort of models. Really, sometimes the model kind of leads to conclusions that are not really required. I say what we're looking for is maybe just the fact of having two things and there's some sort of balance between two poles then they might be poles but they might not be poles apart they might just be two points on a whole spectrum uh, perhaps this is a time for me to mention alistair crowley and the thelemic mythos whose relationship to the egyptian um, mythology and uh, religion is becoming clearer and clearer as the years roll by his philosophy of life, uh, which he called by an ancient pagan world, word, the lema, which basically means following your own way. Uh, and in the words of the song, there's only one way of life, and that's your own. Uh, which is uh, an Egyptian way uh, of view in, 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 within certain limits. Uh I also suggested to say we could call this Alistair Crowley's Egypt as a title for the talk, you know, because Crowley's view of Egypt is, is again, very, very interesting one. Uh, and it's becoming clearer and clearer what bit of the Egyptian culture he was really relating to. And, of course, he stumbled upon this particular philosophy which is important in the modern world, perhaps very central to magic, uh, he, coincidentally or not coincidentally, while he was actually in Egypt in, in 1904. Crowley, Alistair Crowley was a very dual, duality-based life form, <laughs> is one way of looking at it. He was always reflecting on these twin forces that seemed to play out in his life the two entities, God and the devil, which at one point in a poem he says are actually fighting or contending for his soul. Uh, and he kind of, it's almost like he spends the whole night, perhaps this really happened, uh, agonizing about uh, these two, your good and your bad angel, or uh, whatever it is, God and the devil, fighting over his soul. It's a, uh, existential thing and in the morning he wasn't quite sure which one had actually uh prevailed in that struggle uh he wasn't sure which it was and who hasn't been there in some senses that you it's you know that some sort of struggle has taken place but you're really not sure whether the right or wrong or what what the nature of the, the way forward is. I say, it always reminds me of when I get to this, a phrase that I often quote from uh, the, the poet and philosopher Goethe. Uh, and he says that in a similar way, beware when casting out demons that you don't cast out the best part of yourself, which is very good. People always assume you're supposed to cast out demons, although this wouldn't necessarily be the Egyptian way, but it's become a kind of commonplace of modern religion and magic that demons are things that you have to cast out and, and, and get rid of, or certainly until quite recently when people started looking at it a different way. Uh, maybe that's the Freudian thing, that uh, it's not the, the demons are the problem. It's the kind of it's the denial of them, and the attempt at casting out that often causes all the problem. So these are 
again, another ancient duality is between yourself and the demon, your conscious self and some sort of other self. This is a very, very old idea and certainly one you'd find lots and lots in the Egyptian sources uh, that reflect upon this idea of you have another self or the soul or the, is multiple. It has all sorts of bits to it, certainly two major parts that seem to kind of interact and go their own way and come together and all the rest. This is a important thing. You could also say it's a common enough view across all sorts of cultures that that we have at very least a dual nature. We're not singular. Uh, there's there's this kind of struggle. There's you as the incarnate living physical being, and then there's some sort of other entity that is more spiritual, like a ghost even, or a something else, so, some sort of uh, imaginal thing or mental thing. The Egyptians gave it various names. They called it the Ka, sometimes they called it the Ba, and sometimes they called it the Ak. And these uh, technical terms are quite difficult to, people do try and translate them as double and soul and uh, energy body and all that sort of stuff. But it's been suggested that maybe the time to, to rather than keep struggling to try and find English equivalents, just keep them as technical terms and let them w and use them and see how, how it, things pan out. Hindus have a concept of the Gandhava, which also rather romantically means a kind of um, celestial musician. Which is a nice one. It's probably related, but that's a whole kind of belief system. But, but certainly, the Gandhava is also this spirit that kind of comes along in about the third month of gestation, when uh, in the womb, and kind of associates itself with the human being that's going to be born at some point. And and once this partnership has been set up assuming nothing goes wrong, uh, then that partnership persists for the, the remainder of the person's physical life. So that, again, there's the idea of a double. Greeks called it the daemona, uh, which is there from birth and sort of tags along. Again, duality. This is duality. Sometimes, some systems that I've looked at this entity, it seems to be uh, almost every culture has some version of this, and certainly the Egyptians had a kind of way of looking at this, uh, will will be a, of the opposite sex or, or of a different sex then, if you prefer to look at it that way. So you've got this kind of, there's you as, as you are, and then this, there's this other, this other entity that, is a is a is a counterpart in some ways to your physical reality. So if you're a man, you might it might be more of a female entity inside or men, mentalistically. That's certainly one group of people look at it that way. And in folklore of myth, this relationship between the two entities uh, plays quite a big role. Of course, in popular culture, in our own time, this has been brought to life in Philip Pullman's novel, The Northern Lights, uh, where he successfully, I think, brought it to life, the idea of the, the demon or the daemon of uh, the classical tradition, not so much as another person, but as more of an animal spirit. It, he made them animal spirits rather than the idea of them being... And there's some uh, precedent for that, of course, within the Egyptian tradition, where I think the bar is shown as certainly as a, a as an animal, as a bird with a human head. That's another way of looking at it, to show that it's, it's it's got a certain animal quality to it, and that's a whole thing. Uh, as I say, it's a tiny bird uh, that sort of sits on your shoulder or is inside somewhere, or whatever. So going back again to 
Crowley, of course, there's another duality for Crowley is his sexuality, his bisexuality, two sexualities at the least. Uh, he had other dualities which he could pursue, which is some people say he was a charlatan and some people say he was a magus. And, and then other people will say, well, the two things often do go together, really. One is rarely just one. Uh, uh, people can be both. Uh, interestingly, going, his linking him with Egypt, he came up with an idea, again, going back to the social contract. Uh, so instead of a set of laws, he said, well, you don't really have a set of laws, or if you're going to have a law, just have one law, which is... Uh, you say no sin, there is no sin, there is no guilt, only one law, do what thou wilt. So do what thou wilt, uh, which again is like any law code, it always needs people to interpret it and it can be misinterpreted. Uh, and to some people it may seem nonsensical, but it is kind of, it does take us back to the Egyptian idea where Basically, rather than talk a about kind of that. extended you know, there law, are some people who say it does that there is a hints at a law code, but I think that's disputed quite successfully. Basically, it relies on what you might call common sense or common decency and uh, one's inner sense of balance. Again, balance, this duality thing, understanding the balance and the relationship between opposites. This is a, you could say, even an inherently human thing or, or something that people uh, get, get in the course of their upbringing and their education. Uh, that's a whole argument, whether it's there naturally or whether it has to be kind of brought out of people. So as to say, the Egyptians didn't have a long list of commandments, uh, just one, this internal system that your heart kind of, which is a physical organ, but also a kind of psychic organ, uh, sort of two hearts, again, another duality. The heart has got two aspects to it, the physical and the kind of psychological. That's a very, uh, the Egyptians had, two different words for that, the hati and the ib. Uh, and basically, your heart needs to be in the right place. Uh, in, in, in the, and that's got two senses. It has to be physically in the right place. But you have to, it has to be psychologically balanced in some way, in a sense of equipoise. And when that condition is met, then you are able to make reasonable decisions and uh, you know what is right and wrong everybody understands that um and chronicism was a bit like that as well with the kind of strip away all the uh, bad things and but deep down inside people with some exceptions are basically decent uh entities that, that have this heart this sense of right and wrong it brings to mind, again, there's a, uh, if you're interested in philosophy, there's a thing called, uh, there's a philosopher called John Rawls and who had a theory of justice, which, again, you could think of it as very pagan. You kind of just put everybody together and you kind of, you appeal to their common sense. And you can think of a trick to do that, was you could sort of say, well, forget your background and your conditioning you know maybe even to have a, take an amnesia drug if you for, if if you were just in a neutral space what sort of rules would you abide by knowing that everybody's going to have to abide by them equally so and then when you kind of have to revert to the to, to common sense you end up with a set of rules that suits everybody sort of basic pagan idea so to return to ancient Egypt, there's a natural sense of justice or balance, which is called Mart, which even has a goddess uh, associated with it. Sometimes this is also represented as a divine pair, another duality of the of two lions, uh, the god Shu and the god Tefnut. 
so there's al always in this sense there are two natures is it there are two opposites or poles that need to be balanced within the philosophy uh mart the goddess herself often appears actually as a, a twin it's called the the judgment hall in the book of the dead the room is called the hall of the double marty the hall of the two truths the hall of the double goddess mart again this duality and balance is very very important aspect to for the egyptians to bring out uh her image of course is very familiar to us if you think about it and it stands over our own law courts if you're in the uk uh in in london in the area of uh of the inner temple again i've got interesting connections with uh, esotericism being a templar land and all the rest but she's shown there with the with, with a sword and the, or the scales rather than the idea that she's blindfolded justice has these twin poles but it kind of somehow achieves a balance by um you know some sort of reflection upon it by being balanced between by being blind to the kind of the the the, the excesses of each side and taking the middle way which is another aspect middle way between the duality so in all in all these senses then it's all to do with uh the heart uh this sort of dual organ <laughs> and as, as you know even on a physical level you know it's very most of us that find it quite difficult to to uh tell a lie then some people are good at this or they can learn how to do it but most people find it well they can do it you know but uh, the body will usually betray them your heart will your heart especially will begin to be a bit faster and that can be detected uh there's also a sense that certain types of personality you know if you're kind of it, it, this is type A, which we could fit in the idea of type A personality. A type A personality is achievement orientated, work obsessed, competitive, impatient, aggressive, and stressed out. Now, these people exist in the world, and uh, as you might expect, the biggest impact of that kind of personality is on the heart itself which becomes diseased it becomes physically ill so the heart as a physical organ re reacts or is influenced or damaged by the personality and this the egyptians understood this very very well they, they wrote about it quite extensively that the heart indicates the state physical state of the heart indicates something about your inner psyche as well as i say the duality of the two the physical and the psychic are connected and you'd find as it happens maybe this is no coincidence that they also developed the oldest medical text in the world and the first of all the medical texts that they wrote concerns the diseases of the heart and it's all about things like how your personality and lack of balance the again the two do need affects the heart unfortunately a lot of this kind of very very interesting psychology was a little bit suppressed by the romans uh and we had you know before the romans you probably had thousands of years of thinking about this kind of stuff but all of that knowledge and uh, experience was kind of lost to us for quite a long time which is one of the interests of the study of egyptian uh, magic and philosophy is that uh, the idea that th there really is uh, a wisdom there and a, something relevant to the way we might live our lives um 
so we've as i say this is another example even though we 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 think we're on we're not connected to it but we, we kind of are <laughs> it, these sort of ideas had a kind of underground life or they still carry on essentially we still follow their religious calendar anyway so uh even if it's that is slightly suppressed by the kind of more market orientated stuff that comes in with the romans and all the rest there is still this underlying pattern there which is about balance between the seasons between the sun and the moon we're very detached from that now obviously uh by the things just on the banal level of calendar reform and the practicalities of making money and life which is important of course but the uh, romans probably pushed the balance a little bit too far in one direction i said yeah the other things coming close is that if you go to a, a museum um one of the things that will strike you there if you're interested in egypt and if you come on the tour that we sometimes do of magic in the museum uh in oxford museums at the moment but any museum we can do this but uh, we've got quite a good one worked out for, for oxford you one of the things you, you will notice is this a great deal of of paired images of images that are set up as dualities uh twins we in the primary example a number of gods that are set out as twins um uh, and are, are depicted in twin images two gods two goddesses and it's obvious that all of this sort of stuff is rooted in cosmology or some sort of deep divine plan that always has multiple dual principles i think i'll just wrap it up then I think that's probably a, quite a lot to be thinking about how duality and our path between the two poles is is essential really it's, it's kind of such an important part of our lives as it was such an important part of the lives and philosophy of the ancient egyptians so uh thanks for listening and senep tea.